glorify God the Father as we worship, as we sing praise to him loudly and boldly, church, loudly and boldly. God, it is awesome to be in your presence, to behold you. And we recognize this morning that it is only by the power and the grace of your Holy Spirit that that is even possible. On our own, um, in our flesh, we are blind. And so, Lord, we praise you because you have made a way for us to see. And so I pray this morning, indeed, Holy Spirit, that you would be active among us, that you would open our eyes to see you more clearly than we ever have before. I pray that you would give us ears to hear, minds to understand, and hearts to obey. Lord, we thank you that you are the Lord of all creation. We thank you, God, that you hear our prayers. We thank you, God, that you move on our behalf, always for our good, always for your glory. This morning, Lord, I pray that no matter who we are, no matter where we are, no matter the circumstances in which we find ourselves, God, may we rest secure in the knowledge that you are faithful, that you are wise, that you are sufficient for every need, that in our sorrow and in our joy, you are worthy of praise. Again, Lord, we just thank you so much for the church this morning. Jesus, we acknowledge and we praise you as the head of the church. And now as we turn our hearts and our minds to your word, we ask that you would accomplish what only you can accomplish, and that is the supernatural illumination of eternal truth that sets us free. We pray that you would do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, for those of you who don't know me, maybe I just always want you to know who in the world I am. If you don't know me, I'm... Cami Shelatz, and I'm on ministry staff here at Four Mile. If you have your Bibles with you, I'd love for you to join me and open them up to John chapter 2. Um, we're going to start reading uh, at verse 12. It'll also be on the screen behind me if you don't have your Bible or if you're worshiping online. It'll show up, cover me up, and it will be on your screen. So again, this is John chapter 2, uh, starting at verse 12. After this, he, Jesus, went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples. There they stayed for a few days. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle, he scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? His disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. One of my regular prayers for our community of faith here at Four Mile is that God would give us an insatiable hunger and thirst for his word, both personally and corporately, that we would just never be able to get enough of it, that we would long for and cherish it, that we would love and obey it. It is through his word that we know and love God. It is living and active. Its power and its truth are infinite. Every word speaks. 
And there is layer upon layer of meaning and beauty, and every single layer from beginning to end points to the glory of God in Jesus Christ. It is absolutely magnificent. It's really easy in a passage like we just read this morning, it's really easy to fly by the first two words after this. But they're there, and they speak. They point, they connect. To what? Well, that's the question that begs to be answered, right? So though the first part of chapter 2 in uh, the Gospel of John isn't our main passage for this morning, it is very much a part of the context for it. And it really helps us to highlight the contrast, the, this tension that Martin spoke of last week. And that is the theme of our current series. We are convinced that perhaps one of the most crippling delusions among Christians and non-Christians alike is, that, is the idea that the God of the Old Testament is wholly different than the God of the New Testament. That the God of the Old Testament is a God of wrath and judgment, anger and fear. But the God of the New Testament is a God of mercy and grace and love and peace. The God of the Old Testament hates sin and he's demanding and uncompromising. The God of the New Testament is gracious and forgiving of our mistakes and shortcomings. We don't like the God of the Old Testament. He doesn't make us feel good about ourselves. The God of the New Testament is far more palatable and sensitive or to our sensitivities and our preferences, right? He makes us feel all warm and fuzzy inside. If you believe any of that, even just a little bit, you need to know that you are dead wrong. And you are not believing in or following after the God of these scriptures revealed from Genesis to Revelation who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The writer of Hebrews clearly states, in the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. In other words, everything we read in the Old Testament. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being sustaining all things by his powerful word. Paul, when writing to the church at Colossae, described Jesus this way. He is the image of the invisible God. In Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. The God of the Old Testament, starting in Genesis, is the God of the New Testament, which ends in the book of Revelation. And he is the one we worship and exalt here this morning. We can't pick and choose what we like of him and what we don't. We can't decide which scripture we're going to allow to shape our understanding of who he is and what his kingdom is like and which we'll discard. It doesn't work that way. I recently described my husband Jody to some friends of ours as probably the most complex person I have ever met. Layers and layers and depths and depths. He's got a lot. <laughs> and most of them are different than mine. And can I just be honest with you? Many of them aren't necessarily comfortable for me. But I can't just pick and choose what I want and what I don't want, what I like and what I don't like. It doesn't work that way. I either love Jody for who he is, or I don't love or even know him 
at all. And so it's kind of like that. As people who say we believe in and follow after the God of this living book, we can't pick and choose which parts of him we want and which parts of him we would rather do without. It doesn't work that way. It's often not comfortable, but we have got to come to terms with that reality if we are going to truly love and follow after Jesus. So, John chapter 2, I haven't forgotten. (laughs) And verses 1 through 11, so we didn't read this part, but this is the context, remember, of what we just read. So, it's the very first miracle that Jesus ever performed. He and some of his family and disciples had been invited to a wedding. And so that's cool, right? right? We, uh, weddings are fun, and, and it looks like Jesus likes weddings, and we like that about Jesus, right? So far, so good. So apparently at this wedding, they go on for days, they run out of wine. And so Mary, Jesus' mom, gets him involved. And so there's a lot to unpack here, but basically Jesus told the servants who were serving at the wedding um, to get the nearby six stone jars uh, that were used for ceremonial washing and and fill them with water. And these jars held like 20 to 30 gallons each, right? And so filled them with water, and then Jesus turned all that water into really good wine. And that made everybody really happy, right? And we like that Jesus. Never mind the fact that we all too easily skim over or don't even recognize the sobering fact that the wine pointed to and was symbolic of his shed blood on the cross, which would ultimately and permanently cleanse from sin, those who would put their faith in him. I mean, we just like the story, right? We, we like what Jesus did. Well, so did his disciples. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory, and his disciples put their faith in him. So far, This Jesus seems like someone I could really get behind, right? I could follow him. He makes people happy. I like that Jesus. But after this, and there are those two words that kind of help flesh out the context of the passage that we're looking at this morning. After this, just a few days later, this same Jesus was flipping over tables at the temple of all places. Uh, What on earth? I mean, seriously, can you imagine his disciples? Like, what is happening right now? What are you doing? I mean, this this is right near the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry. And so, honestly, people don't know a whole lot about him yet. So to understand what's happening here, we've got to go back to the Old Testament to see what we learn and know about God, of whom Jesus, remember, is the exact representation And what we learn is that from the very beginning, the heart and the desire of God has been to dwell with his people, to be in life-giving relationship with us. God spoke the universe into existence, every last molecule, and he designed this earth to be the perfect place for Adam and Eve to live, a place that God would literally visit. He would come down and walk through the garden, it says in Genesis chapter 3, to be with them and to talk with them, to enjoy them, and for them to enjoy him. Do you think of God that way? As a person to enjoy? Because that is who he is, and that is what he longs with us. 
God created us so that he could dwell with us. It seems to me like, just like we can skim over words or verses or whole stories and themes in Scripture, we can also somehow almost become desensitized to this most amazing reality. God created us, not just so that he could, you know, send us on our way, but so that he could dwell among us, not abstractly or from a distance, but intimately and personally. He created us so that he could pour out his love to us and then through us. He created us so that we could truly know him in relationship, truly love and be loved by him. Have you ever loved someone so much that it was enough to just simply be with them? To just be together? And do you understand, do you feel the weight of the incredible reality that this is what God wants with us? Us. (laughs) But in our sin, in our self-absorption, in our rebellion and our pride, we turned away from him. We rejected him. We thought we could do better. We thought we could find more elsewhere on our own terms. We are so incredibly foolish. We are deluded to think that apart from him, we could ever find or have any kind of life. It is not possible. Apart from him, there is only ever death, only ever sorrow. Is that not what we see all around us? Is that not what we experience? Life apart from him is never what God intended for anyone. He wants to dwell with us, to share his life with us. He wants everyone to have full access to the life that he offers, and it is abundant life. It is life that is peace and joy and hope and truth and goodness. Do you not long for that? Do you not long for that for this world? Church, it is available. Though we turned away from God in our sin, he continued to draw near, to make a way, to pursue us, to invite us into that relationship. As a matter of fact, I mean, it's interesting that when Adam and Eve turned away in their sin, God came to the garden knowing exactly what they had done. He knew, but he came He pursued, and he immediately took action to restore what had been broken. And that's what this entire book is about. God making it possible, in spite of our sin, for us to dwell with him. Seriously, God's desire to dwell And be in relationship with us is the unifying thread throughout the entire redemptive story from beginning to end. He established for himself a people in the book of Genesis, a people to whom and through whom he would reveal himself to the world, a people that he would bless in order that they might become a blessing to all nations in his name. After finding themselves enslaved in Egypt for 400 years, God miraculously delivered his people, the Israelites. We read about that in the book of Exodus. And then God really began to unpack and and explain to them, if you will, what it meant to be his people, what it looked like for him to dwell with them and we with him. In Exodus 25, God directed Moses to begin gathering from the people offerings of of precious metals and and wonderfully colored yarn and fine linen and and goat's hair and, and 
animal skins and wood and olive oil and precious gems, all this amazing stuff, right? Why? Because God, I'm sorry, God was directing Moses to oversee the building of the tabernacle. Have them make a sanctuary for me, God said, and I will dwell among them. Inside this tabernacle, in the Holy of Holies, behind the veil, the Ark of the Covenant rested. And that is where the glory of God would descend. The tabernacle was positioned right in the middle of the Israelites' encampment so that no matter where they were, everyone could see it. And when they moved from place to place, they would literally pack it up and take it with them. It was for the people of God, everywhere they went, a literal, central, and very tangible reminder that their God was dwelling with them. And it set them apart from every other nation and people group in the world. Eventually, after they had come to the land that God promised them, King David once again gathered all the necessary materials so that his son Solomon, once he became king, could oversee the building of a permanent dwelling place for God's presence among them. And that was the temple in Jerusalem. So listen to part of Solomon's prayer of dedication when the temple was finally completed. This is from 1 Kings But will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heaven, cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. Yet give attention to your servant's prayer and his plea for mercy. O Lord my God, hear the cry and the prayer that your servant is praying in in your presence this day. May your eyes be open toward this temple night and day, this place of which you said, my name shall be there, so that you will hear the prayer your servant prays toward this place. Do you hear his awe? I mean, that God would dwell among them was nearly inconceivable. That God would become, or God, that God would welcome their prayers and pour out his mercy and make it possible for them to know him. But that has always been his intent to dwell among us, to make access to the Father possible. That's what the tabernacle and eventually the temple represented. However, It is critically important to understand and remember that God's desire and his willingness to be in relationship with us after our sin didn't come without cost. Just like God explained in detail to Moses and then David how to build the tabernacle and then the temple, he also instituted an extensive sacrificial system because blood had to be shed for sin to be forgiven. I actually just finished uh, reading through, again, the books of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers, and seriously, I am overwhelmed every time I read those books at just how much blood was spilled. It was a rather gruesome near daily reality for the Jew, a constant reminder that the cost of their sin was death and separation from God, and that the only way to draw near was through the shed blood of a substitutionary sacrifice by the priest at the temple. Day after day after month, after month, after year, after year, all the while longing for their Messiah to come. He did. In the beginning, 
the Word was God and the Word was with God. He was with God in the beginning. And John goes on to say in chapter 1, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. God came to us in Jesus. And that verse that I just read could literally be translated that Jesus tabernacled among us. That word gave John's first readers an immediate context in which to understand what was really happening, right? God became a man and lived right there among them as one of them. Why? Because it's always been the Father's intent to make a way for us to dwell with him. And through Jesus, he was making a way for that to be a permanent reality for all who would receive him, Jew and Gentile alike. Do you see that over and over and over, God has only ever continually had wide open arms for all those who would surrender to him in faith, Make no mistake, it is always on his terms, but the invitation has always been available to us. Jesus came to be the final sacrifice. Once and for all, sin would be atoned for by his death on the cross. He was to be the perfect and final Passover lamb, the one who would take the full wrath of God, crucified for the forgiveness of our sin. That's what was on his mind when he turned water to wine at the wedding at Cana. And that's what was on his mind when he walked into the temple just a few days later. Jesus, in whom all the fullness of the deity dwelled in bodily form, walked into the temple, and he could not contain himself. What is it exactly that made him so angry? By the way, it's interesting that we could probably spend a ton of time just looking at and considering the fact that never once did Jesus sin in these moments. This was pure, holy, righteous indignation. And it was very controlled. I mean, it says that he, you know, he thoughtfully and intentionally took the time to make a whip. That takes some time, right? And, and it's widely understood that, that he most likely made that whip out of, like, reeds. And so, rest assured, no one was harmed that day. No animal was harmed. But it was enough to get their attention and get them moving. <laughs> but again, what is... What is so upsetting to Jesus in this moment when he walks into the temple? A lot of commentators say that it was what the money changers and the sellers were doing, charging exorbitant prices, taking advantage of travelers, especially the poor. And certainly there may be an element of that there, but I think it's far more than that. There actually really wasn't a problem with the buying and selling of animals to be sacrificed. People were coming from all over the world to celebrate the Passover. They couldn't, they couldn't be dragging their sacrificial lambs with them. And, and so to make provision for animals to be purchased in Jerusalem, it made sense. And it would also make sense that their foreign currency had to be exchanged. Now, you know, was there abuse and greed going on? There was probably some. But I just don't think that was Jesus' main concern here in this moment. The real problem, Pastor Tim Keller writes, is that they had squeezed out real communion with God, real reflection on the meaning of the substitutionary sacrifice. 
The meaning of the sacrifice was to cover over their sin, which was separating them from God. It was to cleanse them and make communion and intimacy with God possible. It was the only way God could and would dwell with them. But Jesus walks in, and it's a madhouse. People buying and selling and haggling, animals everywhere. Again, to quote Tim Keller, people would come in, they would pay their money, they'd take the animal, they'd turn two steps, they'd give it to the priest. Of course, all the priest could do was turn around, slay the animal, everybody bows, I did my duty, and out he went. There's nothing more you can do in all of that cacophony, in all of that confusion, in all of that noise, in all of that clamor. Jesus sees and hears all this, and he is all consumed with zeal for his father's house, consumed with zeal for his father's heart and intent and desire for his people all along, the whole reason for the temple. Jesus just turned water into wine, wine that symbolized his shed blood for these people. And what he sees in that temple that day is that they don't get it. They don't see what it all means. They should be ready for him. They should be longing for him, but they're not. They don't know what the sacrifice means. They don't feel a need for the Savior. They don't see. They don't have any idea because they're not praying. It's a market. It's mechanical. They're not even engaged. They're not even reflecting. They're not even thinking. And it breaks Jesus' heart more so. It makes him righteously angry. Last week, Martin mentioned a book that we both read as we prepared for this series, and it's called What Made Jesus Mad by a pastor named Tim Harlow. And I want to read to you a little bit of what he wrote about these moments, but I want to first highlight an important piece of information. Verse 4 in our passage says that it was in the temple courts that Jesus encountered the, the pandemonium of the market, right? And that was where the Gentiles would come. It was the very outer part of the temple area. Um, that's where the Gentiles would gather. Gentiles who had heard of the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Perhaps some of them were coming to learn more about this God, but perhaps there were some who had already put their faith in him and they wanted to offer their own sacrifice of worship. But by design, until that veil was torn in two, it was the outer courts where the Gentiles had to gather that's where Jesus was. That's where he was flipping tables. And so now to quote Harlow. Jesus' anger was directed at the Jews who turned the non-Jews' house of prayer into a market, thereby denying access, literally, to the outsiders who wanted to worship God. Making this area into a marketplace was not particularly conducive to worship. In other words, the outside, outsiders, those who felt furthest from the Father, were those who suffered the most. And this was something Jesus cared deeply about. He continues, does it make more sense now? Jesus wasn't zealous for the sanctity of the temple. He prophesied that it would soon be destroyed, and it was. Jesus was zealous for the access to God that the temple provided. He came to rip the veil and give us an all-access pass to a beautiful relationship with our Heavenly Father, the relationship for which we were created. He'll throw over tables or animals or people out of the way to give us this all-access pass. He gave up his own life for it. God wants us in. He is calling us in. And Jesus is never going to stand by and let anyone or anything keep even one of us out. It was not and has never been Jesus' intent. As a matter of fact, 
he would create a scene in a holy place to make sure everyone has access, especially the ones who are furthest away. So what on earth does this all have to do with us? What is our takeaway today? Well, what makes you angry? Are they the things that make Jesus angry? What are you zealous about? Jesus gets angry when anything or anyone gets in the way of people drawing near to his Father. Jesus gets angry when we replace mechanics and ritual with true intimacy and communion with him. Jesus gets angry when we treat his sacrifice, his death, with nonchalance. I have people who pray for me as I prepare to preach and as I come up on Sunday morning. I couldn't and wouldn't do this without the Spirit-filled prayer for God to do what only He can do in and through me and us. And uh, my parents are, are two of the people who pray for me. And yesterday I texted my mom, because my dad has never and will never have a cell phone. <laughs> uh, so I texted my mom to ask her to pray specifically that, that I would be able to land the plane, as it were. In sermon prep, at least for me anyway, it's often the taking off and the landing that are the most challenging. Uh, I've never taken a class on preaching. They have those classes on preaching. Uh, but I would imagine that they don't recommend leaving people uncomfortable I would imagine that they would recommend that we don't end a sermon without resolution. And so I would imagine that if I were to present this sermon in a class on preaching, that I would probably fail. Jesus gets very angry when our worship our lives, our hearts don't reflect the heart of the Father. So we need to ask ourselves, do they? When people encounter you or me, when people come to Four Mile Church, is the loud and clear message by our words, by how and what we're doing, by our very lives, that the Father longs to be in relationship with any who would come to him, made possible through the death and resurrected life of his son Jesus. Is that clear? Are we reflecting the heart of the Father to, to those around us? Or are we somehow keeping or even pushing people away from God? Because our lives, both personally and corporately, are as chaotic and loud and offensive and messy and unruly as the world around us. Don't answer too quickly. Don't assume Jesus isn't mad with you, with us. Jesus gets really mad. And we do well to take that very seriously. Let's pray. Have mercy on us, God. Have mercy on us. We like when 
you do things that make us feel good. We like when you affirm <laughs> us. We don't like it when you're mad. We don't like that part of you. And we just confess that right now, and we ask that you forgive us because we don't get to decide what you care about. We don't get to decide what makes you angry or what pleases you. What is ours to do is to humble ourselves under the truth of your word and the conviction of your spirit and repent and align our hearts and our minds and our lives with yours. We can't do that on our own, Lord. So we ask today that you would move in us, that you would move on us. God, that you would show us if there are areas of our lives that more than make you unhappy, make you angry. And if that makes us uncomfortable, so be it. But may that then just compel us to do whatever it takes to restore the communion and the intimacy and the beautiful relationship that we're meant to have with you and reflect to the world. God, we ask that you do this in the power of your Holy Spirit, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The psalmist did, in fact, say that the world is the Lord's and everything in it. And God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son. Are we getting in the way of people seeing the heart of the Father? Oh, God, may it not be so, church. Have mercy on us, Lord. Cleanse these temples that we would be living reflections of Jesus to everyone around us. Amen. Church, I want to just close with one more thing. I, I, I don't want to leave, I, I, I do want to leave you with joy and hope, right? Because of Jesus. I told you in the sermon that God's desire to dwell with us is the thread that is woven throughout all of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. And so a, a vision was given to the Apostle John, and we read, that's what we read out of earlier. Uh, a vision was given to him of the end of time right? Jesus has returned, and he's made everything new. And so then John tries to describe what he sees. This is what he writes in Revelation chapter 21. This is the thread getting a knot tied in the end of it. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with man, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. That has always been the heart of the Father. Church, live that way. Go and show people the heart of the Father. Amen. He is worthy. Thank you so much for being with us today. We'll see you next week.